Are we dismantling what we created after World War II? Good to be with you, David. The short answer is, is yes. What's worse, we're dismantling it without replacing it with, with, with something uh, better. In some cases, we're not replacing it with anything at all. And the dismantling begins with international institutions. We've pulled out probably uh, from 10 of them by now, different treaties, uh, weakening uh, and weakening uh, alliances. So again, uh, we've essentially, the president is trying to undo a lot of his inheritance and almost like health care, repeal without replace. So the president has said repeatedly on the campaign trail and then as, as president, we've been taken advantage of. The United States has been taken advantage of. Other people are benefiting. We're paying all the bills. What has this international system created after World War II actually done for the prosperity of America? He does think that. When I met with him when he was still a candidate, he believed that that fervently, that trade agreements have ripped us off, and that essentially the costs of foreign policy, our stationing of troops overseas and the like, far outweighs any benefits. What he seems to be missing here, David, is that for 75 years, there's not been a great power conflict. To, to the extent there was a conflict, the Cold War, one, it stayed cold, and two, it ended on terms that were extraordinarily favorable to us. Meanwhile, standards of living in this country have gone up dramatically, one by, by some measures 90-fold since the end of World War II. The average American lives on the order of 10 years longer than he or she uh, lived 75 uh, years ago. Democracy is far more prevalent ar around the world. So I'm hard-pressed, as someone who's trained as a historian, to find any other period of history as productive and constructive as the last 75 years I'm not going to sit here and say we didn't make mistakes. Of course we did in Vietnam, Iraq, and so forth. But by and large, on balance, this has been a remarkable run. Richard, even when uh, Donald Trump came to office, things were changing. I mean, China was growing very quickly. It was growing to challenge us as the world's dominant economic power. Uh, was it inevitable that we had to do something other than what was left over after World War II? Oh, absolutely, for several reasons. One, you point to uh, China has emerged in many ways, and we needed to adjust our policy. And I think the president deserves some credit for calling out China, where I, where I think he gets the, the blame, is I don't see anything coherent or consistent for, for dealing with China. Probably an, an even greater problem with American foreign policy is a lot of the institutions that you referred to are getting long in the tooth. We've got a whole new set of challenges in the world, things like how to regulate cyberspace, what to do about climate change, what to do about proliferation. And we simply don't have the mechanisms in place in the world. There's a real shortfall when it comes to international arrangements. So addressing that has got to be on our agenda. Unfortunately, the president is essentially uninterested or even opposed to international agreements of those sorts. You mentioned China, obviously a terribly important relationship for the United States, economically as well as geopolitically. Uh, where are we headed right now with China if we keep going the direction we are? The president clearly believes that if he keeps putting enough pressure on China, he will do something good for the United States and good for U.S. workers. I can see two things happening if we keep going. In the short run, uh, I'm actually quite worried about a military incident say, between American and Chinese aircraft or ships in something like the South China Sea, the Taiwan Straits, near islands also claimed by Japan and the Pacific. And the real challenge then will, make, will be to try to put a lid on it so an incident doesn't, doesn't grow into a, a conflict. In the longer run, David, I'm actually concerned about a U.S.-Chinese Cold War, uh, an across-the-board uh, competition that at times is, uh, has us lined up against one another. It's dangerous. It's costly, but also it would probably rule out U.S.-Chinese cooperation, say, in dealing with the North Korea or dealing with global health or dealing with climate change. And I think we're pretty far down that road. So one of the focal points of our relationship with China, certainly under President Trump, has been trade. But the trade issues facing the United States are not limited to China. They go much more broadly, including the very institution of the WTO and our relations with Europe, with a lot of our allies. Uh, what is happening because of, to our economy because of what has happened with trade under President Trump? Yeah, we've lost a real chance, I think, to grow global trade and also to improve the way it's regulated. If we had stayed in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that would have teamed us up with countries altogether. We would have represented over 40 percent of the world's GDP. We then could have put tremendous pressure on China to raise its game, to meet our uh, standards. Or well, we could reform the World Trade Organization. It's clearly flawed. But then the question is, how do you make it, how do you make it better? Instead, 
what we're essentially doing is undermining it by not approving any judges for the one part of the World Trade Organization that's actually worked quite well and often in our interest, which is its adjudication panel for, for resolving trade disputes. As you know so well, Richard, we've got an election in this country coming up November 3rd, and including for the President of the United States. Exactly. There's a rumor to that effect. Uh, but, but as you look at that possible fork in the road, how do you look at a Biden, now we know, Harris administration with respect to foreign policy as opposed to Trump-Pence? But I think the, the differences would be uh, much more willingness to work with allies. I think that would probably be sort of the foundation. They deal with allies and then approach all these regional and, and global challenges. I think you'd probably see reentry into various international arrangements and institutions. The problem for uh, a Biden-Harris uh, administration or the challenge would be their inheritance would be rough. It'd be a really daunting uh, inbox. Four years ago, David, you'll recall, I wrote a book called The World in Disarray. Well, now it's disarray on uh, on steroids. So I think they would they would face that all the time. Think about it. The next president and vice president are going to have to still deal with the pandemic here at home. Tens of millions unemployed, a country divided by politics and race, possibly by the election uh, itself. So that you're, they're going to have a situation where there'll be greater demand than ever for American leadership and involvement in the world. At the same time, the home front will be calling out for for repair. So, Richard, you deal with these world leaders on a regular basis. Is there a pent-up demand for an alternative to President Trump? I'm reminded of the fact that at the end of George W. Bush's administration, it was thought that our reputation, some people thought, was not very good in the world. And then President Obama came in. Certainly the Obama administration, I think they turned it around pretty quickly. Is that realistic? Well, I think the greatest demand for change and something like a return to what people thought they knew for the familiar is with our allies. They treasure American reliability and predictability. Consultations are important. So in Europe and Asia is where you find the, the greatest demand for something familiar. But I would think in countries like Turkey or, or Russia, they're pretty happy with what they've got. Countries like Israel and Saudi Arabia were very uncomfortable with the, with the o Obama administration. China can't quite make up its mind. On one hand, the United States has created geopolitical vacuums that China's happy to fill. On the other hand, they find it really hard to, to figure out an America that's so wildly inconsistent. Uh, Richard, you talked about what it might look under a President Obama if he were to be elected. Take it, I'm sorry, a President Biden if he were to be reelected. Uh, but what would the alternative be? Let's assume we have a second term of President Trump. What does that world look like? And particularly coming back to American prosperity, what might it mean for American prosperity? David, in my experience, reelected presidents essentially double down. They continue. They feel they've got a mandate for more of the same or, or in some cases, just more. So I would think a second term would be very familiar. Alliances would wither. The United States would essentially become unilateral, very aggressively protectionist and bilateral on, uh, on trade. Uh, I, think, I think it would be very familiar. But I also think uh, my follow-on article would not be present at the disruption. It would be present at the destruction. And I think in four more years, you would not have the architecture or the machinery that has served us well over 75 years. If President Trump were watching this, he would say, that's great. The problem is, again, I've yet to hear him or anyone who works for him articulate an alternative that looks viable and preferable. So my real concern is in four years, we could face a very rough uh, international envi environment, really turbulent. And for American business, for American investors, they would have to factor in what would be a much rougher, much less predictable or stable world they'd be operating in. And what does that do for national security? You wrote another book saying national security essentially begins at home. It's on our economic strength. Well, it's bad for, by, by any measure, national security, foreign policy begins at home. It doesn't end there. Look, we're, we're suffering now from a pandemic that began in Wuhan, China. By 9-11, it was people who were trained in Afghanistan. Climate change comes from everywhere. So the real lesson of the modern era is that nothing is local or stays local for long. So if we have a foreign policy that essentially gives short shrift to the world, uh, we're going to pay an enormous price for it at home. We as a country, we as a society and an economy cannot thrive in a world that begins to unravel.